I'm going to start us off here tonight. This story is about um, uh, two hours old, so uh, pardon me for using pages here. Uh, this goes back to my 20s. Uh, it was the winter of 1994, and my little posse, my gay circle of friends, we entered this apartment way at the top of Manhattan Island, and as soon as I walked in the door, I heard this laugh coming from the other side of the room, this little, like, chipmunky giggle, like a little kid was being tickled. And my friend Mark said, um, sounds like Mikey's here. Oh, boy. And when we crossed the room, I saw that this little guy, Mikey, he was an Italian guy with beautiful brown skin, brown hair, sparkle in his eyes, big grin. And someone was leaving the party at the time. And Mikey said to them, oh, no, you're leaving so soon? And then he said, uh, Farewell and adieu to your fair Spanish ladies. And I burst out laughing because he was doing his impression of the shark hunter, Quint, from the movie Jaws. And that was an impression I like to do. <laughs> so when I burst out laughing, he really lit up and he said to me, oh, don't mind me, I'm just a big old fooler. <laughs> And I laughed again, and soon I was making him laugh because I could match all of his imitations of Woody Allen and Oliver Hardy. Now, there happened to be this absurdly gorgeous kind of Abercrombie sort of blonde boy there at the party. So Mikey and I started entertaining each other by flirting with this blonde boy only with the accent of Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> The blonde boy was completely baffled and bewildered, but he was clearly like not interested in anyone at the party. He was just looking at himself in mirror after mirror after mirror. And I said to Mikey, seems like he'd be having a much steamier night at Pottery Barn. <laughs> and Mikey burst out laughing. And then I did something that completely surprised me. I grabbed him from behind, around the waist, and I swung him around like you would with a little kid playing swinging statues. And he was screaming laughing now. It was way too affectionate, way too soon. But it felt so good. I, uh, I didn't know what to do next. It was just this full body hug that came out of nowhere. And this might sound odd, but my brain might have taken a little while to catch up with what had happened there, but my body knew. Right in the middle of that hug, I was in love. Now, after that, Mikey ended up hanging out with my whole posse of friends all the time, and I kind of developed a hugging habit. Finally, one night, I wrote out this little speech, this little script that I presented to him over the phone that ended with, and so, would you like to come over for dinner sometime this week? <laughs> and there was a pause, and he said, listen, Kev, um, I've been thinking about this, actually. I just adore, I love how affectionate you, you are with me, but as a friend, I just don't think I feel the same way you feel, and I don't want to lead you on. Well, when I hung up, I kind of felt like the guy who gets all his intestines ripped out of him by the zombies in uh, Dawn of the Dead. And then it occurred to me, Mikey would get that reference. <laughs> I looked at my journal, and the last line that I wrote that night was, I have got to get over this tonight. <laughs> 16 months later, <laughs> I'd grown quite used to that intestines being ripped out feeling. Uh, all of our friends were sick of the Kevin and Mikey cycle. Uh, the pattern was that I'd show up at a party or out for a night of bar hopping and be determined that I was going to stay purely civil with Mikey 
and not let our skin touch. As the evening would wear on, Mikey would become kind of saddened by this and he would kind of start craving my attention. So he'd do something to crack me, like grab my crotch or moon me. <laughs> and of course, I would suddenly become a little puddle and be convinced that, oh my gosh, this is the sure sign that we're going to be lovey-dovey now. And then he'd have to push me away all over again. Now one night, he had no way to get home, and I had him over. And somehow, we allowed ourselves to be in the spoon position in my bed. And I found myself saying to him, God, I wish, I wish I could stop feeling the way I feel about you, but I love you. I love you. I love you. And he said, okay, enough of that talk, enough. And he fell asleep, and for the next two hours or so, I lay there with Bonnie Raitt singing, I can't make you love me if you don't, <laughs> in my mind on a loop. Finally, the week of July 4th, 1996 arrived, and Mikey and a few of my friends had secured a house on Fire Island. Now, in the previous months, I'd done something that was very, very uncharacteristic of me. I had exercised. <laughs> I had become obsessed suddenly with like, 15 hours a week at, at, the, at the gym. So I was really building myself up and I was, it was all preparation for Fire Island. There was a part of me that was like, I'm gonna be so ripped that I'm just gonna find a husband there on Fire Island and forget <laughs> Mikey forever. And then a part of me that added, or this is what will make Mikey finally like me. <laughs> So when I showed up at the house, it was all kisses and toasting of cosmopolitans. But Mikey was just coming out of the shower in nothing but a towel. And he kind of sashayed up to me and he said, oh, fancy meeting you here. And he flashed me his crotch like, you know, a pervert out on the street in a, pre in a trench coat. I instantly became like Sylvester just spotting Tweety Bird and started racing after him around the entire property, just reaching to get that towel off of him. I'm running around and running around and I finally leap over a couch and my foot catches the end of it and I end up with my right knee in my right eye. I had put all that work into prepping my body for Fire Island, and now I had a monstrous, bulbous black eye. Uh, Mikey could not stop laughing because he thought that this was the ultimate Laurel and Hardy moment between us. Another fine mess. But the big night was July 4th. Now, all of my friends had brought an arsenal of drugs. And the legendary DJ Junior Vasquez was playing at the pavilion. And of course, the enchanted forest where all the anonymous sex happens on Fire Island was just overflowing with men. Now, party drugs <laughs> had never gone over too well with me. They didn't agree with me, let's say. But my friend Mark had mentored me that evening. He said, Kevin, Take some ecstasy, but not on an empty stomach. Yeah. Have a few vodka martinis first. <laughs> so after three vodka martinis, I took the ecstasy and went out for a very warm and fuzzy night carousing about the place. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'll leave the part about the enchanted forest out of the story. <laughs> <laughs> But at one point, it's about five in the morning, and I find myself out on the beach, alone. 
and I find myself obsessing over my obsession. What's Mikey doing right now? Is Mikey even wondering where I am? And why can't I stop myself from wondering these things? Before I knew it, that ecstasy, you know, it makes you rather fragile. I've got tears streaming down my face. Well, the moon is shining on me, and I, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I thought, fuck it, I don't care who walks by. I dropped to my knees, and I opened my hands to the heavens, and I said, my God, please help me get over him. I'm begging you, help me get through. Well, I continued down the beach, and I ran into a couple of my friends. And one of them offered me what was called Special K. <laughs> this is a powdered form of a tranquilizer that veterinarians use to put your pets out for surgery. So I took two little sniffs of this stuff and decided to head home, end my evening, and, and go back to our place. Well, the drug overwhelmed me immediately. I was like, oh my God, I have to get into a prone position in a bed as soon as possible. <laughs> then it was as if the gears on the film projector had gotten loose because some images and sounds seemed to be moving in slow-mo and others seemed to be doing jump cuts. And the fan, the ceiling fan above my head, at times, it sounded like a symphony of noise. And then there was this point at which I started to feel like I was no longer on the bed. And I began to feel like I was floating upward and upward, and then progressing out into the living room. And from the opposite side of the room came Mikey. And I was confused. I thought, well, why isn't he with everyone else? But he was laughing. Now, I couldn't speak. I couldn't form words. <laughs> so I just started walking toward him. But his laughter just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then I noticed, so did his body. He was growing and expanding. And by the time he was about an arm's length from me, he was about two feet taller than me. And then I realized he was no longer flesh and blood. He was dissipating into a sort of mist of red and blue and brown. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't say anything. All I could do was keep moving forward. And then I felt this mist on my face and on my chest. And after a moment, I realized I walked right through him. <laughs> and then I felt the bed underneath my hands and feet again and realized I hadn't gotten up out of bed at all. <laughs> but once again, felt myself floating upward and out toward the living room. And there again was Mikey. And this time, he was angry. He was just full of rage. And as I'm going toward him, I'm trying to think what I can do to calm him down. But his body is expanding, and he's growing larger. And as soon as he's up close to me, he becomes a mist again. He dissipates, and I walk right through him. I'm in bed again, and then back in the living room, and there's Mikey, and this time he's crying, and I want to console him. And now I'm enjoying this. <laughs> now I'm feeling like, wow, I'm kind of relishing walking right through. It's as if I'm shielded from the effects that he normally has on me, and I'm just plowing right on. And the pattern repeated about seven times. There was frightened Mikey, and Mikey with like childlike wonder, and seductive Mikey, 
And I just kept walking through until I passed out. And this might sound odd, and it might have taken my brain a couple of days to figure out what I'd been through, but when I woke up that next morning, my body knew that I'd begun to get over him, that I'd made it through. Thank you.